John Maris, thanks for joining me on the podcast today. It's great to meet you. We've not met before, and I'm super excited to talk to you. I don't, I don't um, sell wares, but I am a big fan of one of your products, which is the Solo Stove. My brother bought me one a few years ago. It's an amazing, amazing invention, amazing fire pit. So I'll let you explain more of what it is to the audience here, and maybe talk a little bit about your your background and and how you got here. Yeah, for sure. So Solo Stove is. Uh is the kind of foundational brand inside of the, the, you know, our, our house of brands underneath solo brands. And, um, you know, as you mentioned, it's a, it's a really, really great product that kind of was, was born underneath the, the solo stove brand. It's a stainless steel. Now we've added some color, but stainless steel cylindrical fire pit, which sounds pretty simple actually. Um, and in a lot of ways it, it is, but it's a wood burning fire pit that burns nearly smokeless. So if you've ever sat around a campfire, uh, most likely if it was a traditional type type campfire, you've played musical chairs trying to avoid the smoke. Um, and no matter where you sit, it, it kind of seems to follow you and, and find you and you, you, you feel like you've got a smoke magnet on you. Uh, Solo Stove really sought to solve that problem and kind of bring that primal, really amazing campfire type experience um, to every backyard in America. And and give people the opportunity to sit around a campfire without having to play the musical chairs or smell like smoke or or whatever. And um, it's just been a phenomenal run. My story to to joining the brand is 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 kind of an interesting one. I met the founders. It was two brothers that founded the business about four and a half years ago. Is when I met them. And um, you know, I think in the first meeting uh, there were there was some line along the lines of of you know we've reinvented fire. And to give you a little context, I, I grew up on a 50 acre ranch in Texas and I, I spent, I don't know how many nights uh, in my youth sitting around fires, but it was a lot. And uh, I remember sitting in that first meeting and hearing, you know, we reinvented fire and thinking to myself, what a joke, you know, <laughs> fire's been around a really long time. This is the 21st century. You know, it's a pretty bold statement to say that, uh, you know, two young guys in their garage reinvented fire. How could that be? And uh, in a very skeptical fashion, I took took the product home for the first time. And, uh, you know, my wife's one that, uh, you know, we've always, because of my upbringing, we've had, you know, some sort of built-in type fire bowl or fire contraption in the backyard since my wife and I've been married. And over the years, she's become less and less participatory in those fires. And my kids and I would spend time outdoors, uh, you know, in our backyard making s'mores and, and doing the fire thing. And I remember bringing the fire pit home and telling her like, this is going to change our lives. Like these guys said it's smokeless. And she's like, whatever, you know, like no way. And I went in the backyard and, and made, made our first fire in the solo stove. And it sounds like, uh, you know, probably a similar experience to what you had uh, about 30 minutes in, I'm sitting out there just like staring at this thing going, how is, how is this possible? And went and grabbed my wife, brought her outside, and uh, the rest is kind of history. Nine days later, I, I started at the business, which was in 2018, and um, have been here ever since. But uh, Stove has experienced a, a ton of, of growth. Solo Stove has been um, just a rocket ship business since I joined. And, uh, you know, to put it in context for, for some of the things we're going to talk today about in, in terms of culture, when I joined the business, we, I was the seventh employee. So we were a really, really small team. Um, and, and as probably all of us that are listening to this know, small teams tend to be much easier to manage from a culture standpoint than large teams. And so at the time, it was just such an awesome experience to be able to kind of grab and know every employee individually and interact with them, you know, frequently on a daily basis. That, that obviously has changed over time. But as the business grew, uh, we saw opportunities to continue to expand the, the business, not just in our own product innovation, but also through acquisition. So um, we took some of the success that we had seen at Stove and in, 20, in 2021, so about a year and a half ago or almost two years ago now, um, started talking to other businesses that were in the outdoor space, kind of like Solo Stove was, but in completely different ways. And we're doing a really good job at connecting with their customers. And, you know, it's, it's interesting, but, you know, I've always said at Solo Stove, there's something really special about sitting around a fire with friends and family. Uh, it's, it, it is very primal. And, you know, I always say like, it doesn't matter like if you're young or if you're old and everything in between, but everyone enjoys 
sitting around a good fire with people they love. And, um, you know, if, if you're with your young kids, you know, it can be, you know, your, your, your funnest night of the week, you know, making s'mores or whatever. And you can be with your teenagers, you know, around the fire. And it could be the first night of the week that they put down their phone and actually have a, you know, meaningful conversation with you. If you're with your spouse and that's, you know, kids are, kids aren't around. It can be your most romantic night of the week. And, you know, you can be with your, your elderly parents and it can be, you know, a walk down memory lane. So there's just something really cool about a, a, a campfire type experience in your backyard and being able to do that on a regular basis. And, and I've fallen in love with it. I really, I fell in love with it as a kid uh, growing up on a ranch, but um, we just recognize that as, as much as we loved what our business and our product was doing for people in terms of making those connections and helping them have those experiences, that there were other businesses that were doing something similar in a different way. And uh, we started leaning into that. We acquired three businesses in 2021. We, we bought a, a, an origami kayak business called Oru Kayak. It's a kayak that folds into the size of a box. You mm. can put it on your back like a backpack. It weighs 20 pounds and um, you can hike with it. You can put it in the backseat of a Prius um, and, go, and go kayaking in it. What, what it really did is it made kayaking and getting into the outdoors accessible for a big cohort of people that either lived in the city and didn't have space for a kayak or had gotten older and weren't in a position physically to be able to lift a kayak and load it up on the top of their car and, you know, ratchet it down and get to where they were going and unload it and do all the things that are kind of required to get into kayaking. Um, after we bought Oru Kayak, we got into uh, a business called uh, Isle Paddleboards. Uh, it's a, a surfboard and paddleboard business out of San Diego both hard and inflatable uh, surfboards and paddle boards. Again, also leaning into water recreation, but just this idea of getting people outdoors and getting them to experience their tagline is, is life is better in balance. And, and, uh, and, and obviously, you know, you got to do a lot of balancing when you're out on the water, which is, which is a lot of fun. Our acquisition kind of spree in 2021 culminated with the acquisition of a, a really cool uh, apparel business uh, called Chubby's. If you're if you're not familiar with Chubby's, it's a it's a men's swimsuit swimwear and and uh, and short shorts brand. Um, it's kind of what they really made their their name on. Since they've expanded into pants and and really kind of um, I'd say personality rich designs. Um, there's very few places when I have a chubby shirt on uh, that I don't, you know, whether it's in an airport or out in public that I don't get somebody that stops me and says, just love your shirt. And they're smiling back at me. And I, I love that about it. It was actually what attracted us to the brand. A lot of people ask us, well, that's not really in the outdoor space. You know, how did you end up with chubbies? Um, and it's just that all of our brands, the common denominator is focused around putting smiles on faces, you know, making people a little bit happier than they were before they, they were introduced to our brands and, um, and just and just growing them. And so culturally, we've we've tried to to really allow that purpose uh, that we have across all of our businesses to infiltrate uh, how we do things, why we do what we do, um, who we do it with and, and so forth. But that's a little bit about Solo Stove, which which eventually morphed into Solo Brands as we acquired these these other three businesses I just described. Oh, that's really fascinating. And um, I'd love to love to dive into your own journey. Cause you said, I think you said you were the seventh employee and did you start as the CEO? Did you become the CEO? Talk a little bit about that leadership journey. I did. I was hired as the CEO. I was, I was uh, lucky in, in that regard. The founders, um, you know, had grown the business. It, it was really a hobby, you know, kind of side hustle for them. They, they moonlighted the business for six or seven years and, um, it had gotten to a size that they really had never really anticipated or expected it to get to and um, didn't have a lot of interest in kind of managing the, the people growth side that was going to be required at the size and scale that we had gotten to. And, um, and so they were out looking for a CEO and, um, you know, my background's an interesting one. We were, we were talking a little bit earlier, um, you know, before, before the show about our, our personal journeys and, you know, mine like yours is is not very traditional. Um, I was I was a, an entrepreneur turned sales guy, turned operation lover, turned CEO, and and so I've kind of just been through the full gamut um, 
I started a residential alarm company out of my undergrad. Uh, the primary driver of revenue into that business was just door knocking, like literally going to neighborhoods and knocking on doors and trying to sell alarm systems. Um, and I did that for about four years and then went back and got my MBA at UT in Austin and, um, and then, uh, and, and was fortunate enough to meet, uh, the, a, a guy that's to this day is, is, is one of my best friends and, and, uh, and mentors who was, was working at a media company in, in Dallas. And, um, he was fascinated with the whole door knocking side of the business that I had come from. And I was fascinated with the business they were running. And finally, one day we were sitting in a room and, and he's like, man, you know, you should come work for us. And, and I was like, man, I would really like to come work for you. And, and, uh, and so I said, well, what, what will I be doing? And, and he said, well, we don't really know, but you should just come, we'll figure it out, you know, when you get there. But, uh, so I started with them and, and went through a variety of roles, but all, all pretty growth sales focused roles, um, started out just, just with myself and, Within about a month or so, I'd been given a small team of maybe four uh, employees to work for me, and um, we found some success while I was there, and and uh, you know did did a lot of a lot of good at that business. And um, about a year later, I had the opportunity to continue to scale uh, my opportunities there with with my team, and I left about three years after I'd started. Um, but as I as I grew and, and scaled at the time that I departed the business, I think that my team was about 120. Um, and so it was it was it was a really fun ride. But I, I that was my first big foray. I had started my business. My company was was not small. The, the, the alarm company I was talking about, we had gone from, a, a, you know, basically myself and a partner to about 100 people. Um, but then I kind of went through that same exercise um, at the media company I was working for, where we had gone from, you know, a team of four to manage to a team of 120 or so to manage. Um, and then I was I was um, I was asked to come over uh, to a company called Claris Glassboards, uh, which is the the innovator of the glass marker board space. If you if you've seen a marker board now uh, that's glass instead of a traditional whiteboard or a blackboard, the company that I that I was uh, the chief revenue officer at was really responsible for that, that evolution in writing surfaces. And, uh, and very similarly, um, <clears throat> I, uh, I, I came into that business. It was, it was more sizable, uh, than any of the others that I had, had joined from a people from about, about the size of the media company, but we had a few hundred people at that company. I was managing, uh, probably about 30 to 40 when I joined and then was able to scale my, my sales team up to just over a hundred I think that what was unique about that opportunity for me was that the team of salespeople that that I worked with were all 1099. They weren't W-2 employees. So this was my first foray into learning how to build a culture with a group of people that technically weren't employed by me. They didn't have to do what I said. And so it was a it was a different dynamic of of motivating them through um through positivity to get them to want to show up uh, versus kind of saying, hey, you know, this is your job. This is what you have to do, which is kind of what, what I'd been through prior to that. Um, and then it was from Claris Glassboards that I, I was introduced to the founders of, of Solar Stove and, and ended up joining the business here and, and, uh, and watching this business kind of go through what it's been through the last four and a half years. So my evolution has, has been an interesting one, again, from kind of entrepreneurship to sales, sales leadership. I got uh, exposure to operations at Claris Glassboards. We manufactured all the product in-house. And so that was my first kind of view into manufacturing and what operations is and how sales and operations kind of work together to, to create a symbiotic relationship. And, and then was able to come over to Solo Stuff and kind of put all that together as the, the CEO. And and so in the last, you know, four years now, roughly that you've been CEO, you've gone from seven to, I think you said about 350 employees. And so how, how have you done that? How do you scale an effective culture? Because I would, I would argue that we've, we've deluded ourselves that we could, we could tell people what to do. You know, when I was a CEO, I had about 200 employees and I thought, okay, good. Now I'm finally a CEO. I can tell people what to do. 
and then I realized that that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. That uh, we've we've grown up in that mindset, but really that's not true. We we humans have much more freedom than that. So how have you scaled this culture and created uh, such a powerful team? Yeah, I, uh, the, the, that that is a correct statement. We definitely have a powerful team. I don't know that I've done a great job scaling the culture, to be honest with you. It is it is the hardest thing for sure um, that I do every day, um, you know, even as a public company CEO. Building and managing culture is is so hard, and I think um, I think it's gone through evolutions with us. Um, I think that the culture shows up in different ways with different sized businesses, and you just I, I think for me probably the thing that's helped the most has been just recognizing. You know, there's a really good book. Um, called uh that, that that's titled what got you here won't get you there mm. and um it's one of my favorites and, and and it's it's not a culture book it's it's really a behavior focused book but there's so much overlap with culture if you just read it from that perspective from the culture perspective because so oftentimes as a leader you you go into your business and you go okay this worked, you know, that culture worked in this environment or this behavior drove this culture at this size business. So I'm just going to duplicate that again here. And then you realize it, it completely, it completely falls on its face. And, and I think that I've learned a lot uh, going through that experience and recognizing that at every, there's kind of been these trigger points <clears throat> in our business size from an employee count standpoint that have required step changes in behavior related to culture in order to continue to scale culture in the way that's healthy for the business and to me those 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 points were going from seven to about 70 employees and about at 70 we had to start behaving differently than we did when we were seven mm. we could get away at 25 and 40 and even 50 um with with how we had been behaving but at 70 i found that it was it wasn't working to behave the same way. And we went through the same thing when we went from about 70 to about 120. And then what we had been doing at 70 just stopped working really well uh, at 120. And, um, and then the next big one was, was when we acquired other businesses. And I recognized that meshing four cultures together, talk about just scaling people, that's one thing. But taking four organizations that all have their distinct cultures and trying to mesh them into one, uh, there was no way that we could do what we were doing at 120 successfully to, to mesh these together. And it had to be viewed at completely separately. And I'd say I still feel like we're in the work of that. Even, even a year and a half later, we're still in the work of really figuring out how to, proper, how, how to properly drive and manage uh, the culture of, of our combined businesses together into one. So it is, it's, it's an evolution, but if I, if I summarized it, I would say that what got you there, what got you here won't get you there is, is probably the best way of putting it as you scale. Well, I love your candor, frankly, and your honesty, because there's lots of CEOs would, who would kind of um, puff up and give you a, a, frankly, a BS answer, sort of a canned answer, um, even though they know below the surface that the culture is not where they want it to be. Um, sure. And so I think that's probably part of your secret sauce, John, is, is that your, your just willingness to be honest with people is, uh, is a great part of the, the solo brand's culture. Um, and I don't know if you want this as, as the good news or the bad news, but in our estimation, the work is never done. You know, it's, it's literally, you, 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 there's lots of things you can do, obviously. Um, I joked with my, my business partner, Brad, that it took me about four or five years to get my team where I wanted them as a, as a CEO. I could have done it in five months with his help. Um, there are ways to accelerate it, but it does take hard work. It's not a, there is no silver bullet. There is no, you know, so much of what we think about as culture is not, it's, it's, it's perks and benefits. It's, um, you know, it's free lunches and dry cleaning and work from home. All that stuff is not bad, but it's not culture. The culture really is, to your point, it's really behavior. How do we go about 
figuring out not just behaviors on the surface, but down below the surface, what are, what are the unconscious behaviors that we're collectively bringing to the, to the work? Because that's what, that's what shapes the, the, the culture. Um, so I, again, I just appreciate your, your open, honest answer. It gives hope to, I'm sure to lots of listeners out there that, um, that they're not alone, um, that if they're having challenges with their team and their culture, that's completely okay. It's completely normal. Now the question is, what are you going to do about it? Absolutely. And I, I think that that's the key. Um, I, I love your last line there is what are you going to do about it? And I think that that's the call out that that I would make is that you you said it very well. And, and I'll, I'll just spin it around and say it slightly differently just to reemphasize the point. Culture is not what you say. It's not what you talk about. And it 100 percent is not what you put down on a piece of paper. Culture is actually how you behave. It's how you act. It's what you do. And so if you want to change your culture, then you have to change your behavior. It's the only way. You can sit for two weeks on a beach with a book and a notepad and you can, you know, de 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 disconnect from your business and, and, uh, and detach from the day in and day out. And okay, I'm just gonna clear my mind and I'm gonna write, I'm gonna really figure out what we're gonna, what this culture is gonna be. And there's not a problem with any of that, except for when you believe that by going through that exercise and printing out a piece of paper and handing it out to your team that your culture is gonna start evolving into that. It just isn't. It, what my experience is, has shown is that you have to do the hard work that you're referencing because the hard work is actually changing behavior. <laughs> and that then is what results in a distinct culture shift if, if you're trying to change a culture. If you're trying to maintain a culture, um, because these are two very distinct things, and again, back to the scaling from seven to 350 and what that's been, to maintain the culture that we had at seven employees at 70, and at seven from 70 to 120, and now the work we're trying to endeavor in to take four brands together and, and, and create a culture is requiring that we make sure that the behaviors that we want our culture to be reflective of are happening from the very top and all the way to the very bottom of the organization. And that's why it gets harder, to, to be completely frank, is because we're human. You mentioned this earlier, and human nature... Um, mandates autonomy and free thinking and free thinking leads to free behavior <laughs> and free behavior leads to free culture <laughs> and none of us want free culture <laughs> what we want is established defined culture and in order to get that you actually have to influence people's human nature to fix their behavior to align with your culture so that you can then and, and infiltrate the, 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 the human nature inside of every single person inside the business and then reinforce that culture that you're trying to drive. And that is, I mean, gosh, I mean, just replay what I just said over and over again and tell me that that's an easy exercise. I mean, there's just, it's just not, you know, nothing about it. And if anybody that's raising children knows that, um, you know, I've got five kids and, and, you know, you try to kind of create a culture inside of your family and it's, you know, Unfortunately, kids are no, no one kid is the same as the next. And so even with my five kids inside the same family, they're all so distinct. And so you right when you think you've got culture figured out with one kid, the next kid behaves differently. And you're like, oh, shoot, it's totally screwed my my plan up. And, and uh, an organization is no different. Right. A family is just a smaller version of a, of a larger a larger business organization. And and, uh, you know, that's the challenge at hand. Right. It's it's uh, both the opportunity and the challenge. And and um, and that's. That's what makes leadership fun is that, like you said, it's never over um, because you're always bringing new humans into the into the mix, yeah. into the cog, you know, and and uh, and and ultimately those humans are going to bring unique perspectives and experiences and behaviors in. And, and uh, your job as a leader is to mold those behaviors into the right culture. Yeah, especially when you're growing at such a rocket ship like growth, you know, that that you guys are going through. Um, it's uh it's actually a little harder than that, even John, than what you said. It's, you know, most of what's missed in this work that we found anyway, is, is, I know you'll come in and, and consultants will come in and they'll do sort of the traditional 
mission, vision, value stuff. And that's all important and, and valuable, um, but it misses the underlying point that what makes culture so different, difficult to change is that it's mostly unconscious. We don't realize the things that we're, we're doing and how we're contributing. So if you wanna improve a culture, um, cause I would argue you can't even maintain a culture. You have to, you're either improving or you're sliding down, uh, you're coasting, which means you're going downhill. Um, that if you want to improve that, you can't change anybody. You can't fix anybody. They have to want to improve themselves. They have to be committed, more committed to their, their better self, a better version of themselves in the future than they are to their own comfort zone. And the comfort zone is a is a powerful thing for most of us humans, especially, you know, if you're sitting around that makes me think of the fireplace, <laughs> sitting around a, a fire, um, in your case, looking at five kids saying, oh, this is an interesting culture we got right here. This is our all slightly different human beings I've got <laughs> sitting with me. Yeah, there's there's no doubt. And that's that is a great call out. Um, because I completely I, I completely agree and, and have found that there is there is no maintaining of culture. It's either enhancing or it's deteriorating um, just by nature of, of what it is. And 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 for that reason, it is a constant effort. Uh, but I love the perspective of the the unconsciousness uh, of of uh, of so many of the behaviors that we just you know in our day in and day out we just kind of go through without even thinking about it you know I don't know how many I remember reading somewhere sometime how many decisions we make in a day and I, I I'm not even going to purport to to remember you know the the gravity of that number but it was a lot is all I remember and I remember thinking man like I probably actually think about you know a few handfuls of of, of decisions on a daily basis. And the rest of them are all just kind of happening <laughs> by by habit or 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 you know just just whatever it might be, um, and so that's that's a great point uh, around culture because so much of your behavior is is really done. I won't even maybe maybe unintentional isn't fair, but uh, but certainly subconsciously um, in in terms of of what you're doing every day. Yeah, there's a great book um, de uh, from David Brooks called The Social Animal. And he actually talks about how, you know, at any given time, the human brain can process about 11 million pieces of information. You know, think about that for a second, 11 million pieces of information we're processing. Most of it, you know, if you think about anatomically, just the act of walking requires an amazing amount to be happening in our brains and our muscles and our tissues and our feet, you know, it's, it's fascinating. He said, of those 11 million, we're conscious of about 40, four zero, 11 million to 40. Like it's, it's not even close, right? Um, and we think as human beings that we're so conscious, you know, folks like us that got our MBAs, we think we're so smart. Like we're, we're very logical. We're very data-driven, you know, all this stuff. But the reality is that we're nowhere near what we think we are. Um, and it's a great, it's a great thing. Thank God. If we, if we had to think about all that stuff consciously, we'd be exhausted by 8 30 in the morning. So it's a huge strength that we humans have. The question is as leaders though, what do we do with that? How do we, what are those 40 things that really do need my attention? And how do we help each other as a team? How do we, how do we help each other realize, you know, Hey, John, you're doing that thing again, where whatever, or Tom, you know, you're, you're retreating into your head. We don't know what you're thinking. Think out loud with us. You know, how do we create a team where we can, we can help each other grow and improve? Um, I just realized we're almost out of time and I, um, this has been a lot of fun and I've got like a, a 10 more questions, but I really want to hear specifically on one of the things I saw on your website. I think it was in a blog somewhere was this idea that we all have to create our own fire. Um, so I'm just curious what that is. And then we'll, we can wrap up with a book recommendation that you have. Yeah, you know, I, I just, just inherently believe that. I don't know the 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 more experience and the older that I get, like everyone has something to give, and um, you know, you can use the word purpose if you want. Um, you know, you can use the word mission if you want. You know, whatever, whatever whatever, you know, really jives with, with your psyche. But, 
the reality is, is like, I just believe that everyone was, was put on the earth to, to achieve what their thing is. And, um, and that's why I don't stress a lot. I've never gotten caught up with, you know, if, if somebody in my organization decides to move on, or, you know, if I, you know, if I realize it's time for myself to move on from something or, or if I decide to stay and, and lean into something, I just, there's a time and a season for everything and everyone has something to give. And, and as it pertains specifically to, you know, making your own fire in a lot of ways, it's, it's figuring that out, you know, what's, what's your thing. And, you know, of course you can have more than one thing, but um, you know, sometimes people will have a thing personally, you know, I, I certainly have one, you know, as a, as a father and a, a, a husband um, and then professionally. And, uh, and I just love the idea around it. You know, making a fire is very, there, there's an art to it. Every fire is different. It's kind of like a thumbprint. Um, no, no, no single fire is ever exactly the same. Um, just like no piece of art is just like no fingerprint is. And I just love the idea of people leave, being able to leave their fingerprint on things. And, and I, I think for any leader that's listening to this podcast and trying to really understand culture and how they can have a better influence over the culture of their organization, just recognize that like nobody is like you exactly. Uh, we're all unique. We all have our way of doing it. And, and, and one of the things I've learned probably more than anything else is that there's never one right way. It's, it's just never been that way for me. There's so many ways to, to win. There's so many ways to succeed. There's so many ways to build culture. What's important is to be authentic in the way that you do it. Don't be phony. Don't be somebody that you're not. Don't try to, don't read a book and then try to take that culture and put it into your org. It will never work. But what will work is if you are genuinely a good person and, and just authentic in your way of going about building the culture and doing it the right way and, and, and not letting your ego or your, your selfishness or your pride get in the way of, of doing it right. My experience has been uh, that when you do that, you know, in a lot of ways you're making your way, right? You're making your own fire and, and giving the team around you something to warm their hands on, uh, something to get excited about, something to be, something uh, to put a, that puts a smile on their face. And there's just something awesome about that visual for me. Um, so when I, when I say, you know, go make your own fire, we should all be making our own fire. That's, that's really what I'm thinking about. It's just being authentic and recognizing that all of us have something unique to bring to the world. Yeah, that's awesome. I love it. It reminds me of, mm -hmm. we were talking about before the podcast about one of our clients in, in Northern Minnesota. And um, one of the guys up there said, you know what? I just realized that my job as a leader is to help my team rekindle their fire. That was, that was literally verbatim what he said. And I just tied on to what you said, which is we all have this fire inside of us, at least in my opinion, that was given to us, you know, at, at birth. And the job of leadership is to unleash that, is to help people un, uncork that because through life we get, traumas and we get beat up we get we get fired from jobs i i have been you know we start to lose that that fire but the 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 pilot light is always there you know our job as leaders is to help people reignite their own fire and, and our own and uh, our own as well yeah i love that that's awesome it's really cool so how about a book what book would you recommend for our audience you know, just just based on the topic, there's so many that I love. I I have been really lucky uh, to have gotten to know um, Mark Randolph, who's uh, one of the co-founders at Netflix. Mm. And um, Mark is is a culture genius, in my opinion. I mean, I've never met anybody that understands and 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 has developed as distinct of a culture as as he did inside the Netflix organization, uh, along with his co-founder. And he wrote a book that I think is, is really just does a great job at getting you into his mind on how they did that. And it's, it's called that will never work um, is the name of his book. And, and of course, you know, it's, it's a, it's a spinoff of, you know, all the naysayers around Netflix that said it would never work. Um, it's kind of where that title came from, but so much of, of the way he built the culture is woven into uh, that, that book. And, and, uh, I think is pretty relevant to some of the things that we've talked about today. Okay. 
I've not heard that. I love that title. Though. That's fantastic. You could apply that to almost every culture. You know, you've got the the folks who are rooted in the past who will say, well, that won't work or we tried that before. And um, if you really want an innovative culture, you got to break through that malaise. <clears throat> yep. And it does um, it in a practical kind of, you know, telling the story of how the business was born um, versus kind of your more traditional culture focused books that are more psychological based and that kind of, so to me, I like the, the application side of, of kind of being able to see it in action. I think that that, that could, could, could be beneficial to some of the, some of the listeners today. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. It's uh, I'm sure it'll be almost as good by uh, Brad and I are writing this book right now. We're in the final phases, we hope. Um, and uh, it's called the great engagement. It's the, it's playing off this whole idea of the great resignation. You know, yep. So, yep. so many people have, lost a true sense of engagement in something that matters. They've lost their fire, right? Yep. Yep. Um, and uh, the subtitle is how CEOs create exceptional cultures. And it's based on our 30 years of, of doing this work. Um, and I've, I have a whole new found respect for authors because it has, we thought it'd be fun and quick and easy. Um, not, that's not fully true, but in the ballpark, um, it, is, it is hard and painful, <laughs> frankly, to distill the work we do with human beings in person into a, a little book. And so for our audience out there, we'll, we should have that out by this summer and we're really excited about it. So, um, well, John, thanks again for your time. I really appreciate it. And uh, just appreciate the, the work you guys are doing. I love this idea of how do we, how do we bring more joy and happiness to the, to the outdoor world and hopefully the indoor world once you guys get there. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks so much. It's been a lot of fun to be on with you today.